Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. In today's episode of Makeup and History, we are going to talk about cults. Cults can be defined as a group of people who have unusual or excessive beliefs whenever it comes to spirituality, religion, philosophy, amongst other things. This isn't the only way that the word cult is used. Movies and certain forms of entertainment can be described as having like a cult following. This use of the word cult does not have a negative connotation that just means someone who is like extremely into it like the rocky horror picture show for example even though the use of the word conjures up some negative feelings it doesn't always have such a bad connotation behind it there are many different kinds of cults like political groups destructive groups doomsday groups polygamist groups and many many more but today we're going to focus on the dark side of cults and we are going to discuss some of the most notorious cults in history. Let's jump right in. One of the first groups that I would really like to talk about is Om Shinrikyo. Now the leader whose name was Shoko Asahara was born in 1955. He lost his vision in his left eye and he experienced partial loss in his right eye due to infantile glaucoma. He was later sent to a school for the blind where he was known as quite like the problem child. He tended to bully some of the other kids and <laughs> extort money from them. Good start, right? <laughs> so around age 29 in 1984, Asahara founded the beginning stages of Om Shinrikyo. It was originally known as Omu Shinsen no Kai, and that translates to Om Immortal Mountain Wizard Association. Interesting. The group originally started off as a yoga and meditation class, and it received official recognition as a religious organization in 1989. Now, this religion also attracted a lot of the elites from Japanese society. This group became most well known due to the sarin gas attack on a Tokyo subway system in March of 1995. The attack ended up killing 13 people, seriously injuring 54. And the numbers aren't exact on this because they think that certain people in society are nervous about coming forward with their experiences. But it is estimated that over 900 other people were harmed in the attack. I will do a deeper dive into this later if you guys would like, but for right now, I just want to do like a little list type thing. and discuss some different ones because I, I love learning about especially like true crime stuff. It's just the kind of stuff that I'm into. <laughs> In May of 1995, Asahara was apprehended by the police. He was found hiding in one of the facilities used by the group. He was indicted on a multitude of things, not just the attack, and he faced almost 30 counts of murder. Now the prosecutor in Asahara's case said that the motivation for the attack was, quote, to overthrow the government and install himself in the position of Emperor of Japan, which that's kind of a reach. In February of 2004, he was convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. But his execution was postponed due to many more arrests involving members of Om Shinrikyo. His legal team had filed two appeals for retrials, but they were declined he was later executed July 6th, 2018. Now the group later split after the conviction of Asahara into Aleph, I think that's how you pronounce that. We all know I'm not good at pronouncing things here. Hi, hello, it's me. A-L-E-P-H and Hikari no Wa. I'm trying to pronounce things correctly. Now the Tokyo High Court decided to resume surveillance on the splinter groups because they didn't find a significant difference between Om Shinrikyo and the others. In total, I believe that there have been approximately 13 members that have been executed. Now this group was not only involved in this attack, they were involved in a multitude of other crimes. And I think it's crazy how it started off as something seemingly so innocent, but this is also how a lot of these groups also start. It really just depends on the group and the leader's situation, their mindset, their history, how they deal with people. That makes it morph 
into something more negative. It's fascinating to me. I'm gonna blend a little bit. I'm also gonna let my battery charge and then we'll get on to the next one. I got it a little bit more blended. Another group I find particularly interesting is the FLDS and their leader, Warren Jeffs. Jeffs is the president of the FLDS, which stands for the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they are a polygamist denomination. They are incredibly private and Jeffs has been in quite some trouble. Now there have been many controversies surrounding this group, primarily the marriage of underage girls to men that are old enough to be their fathers. In 2006, Jeffs was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list whenever he fled to escape his charges pertaining to the marriages of the underage girls. In August of 2006, while on the run, Jeffs was arrested after being pulled over for a routine traffic stop. They found a whole bunch of money with them. I think it was about $50,000 in cash, multiple cell phones, multiple computers, other devices, and bunches of wigs and other means of disguise. Now he was charged in a few different states. I think it was Arizona, Utah, and Texas. In September of 2007, he was found guilty on two counts of being an accomplice to rape. From there, he was sentenced from 10 years to life in prison. In Texas, he was found guilty of sexual assault of a child for having sex with one of his underage wives and also aggravated sexual assault for another one of his wives who was 12. For those crimes, he was sentenced to life plus 20 years and he also had to pay a fine. While he was in prison in Utah, he attempted to hang himself. And in 2011, he also ended up in a coma, in a medically induced coma due to excessive fasting. And he has also participated in hunger strikes amongst other things. Now these crimes that I've discussed so far are not the only ones that he's been accused of. He was also accused of sexual assault by his nephew and a few other members of his family, including two of his own children. I really hate that for them. I really do. That's, it's, it's just so sad. I think, see, like, I'm a little bit awkward talking about some of this because it feels like it's, it's kind of heavy, you know. I'm a survivor of assault myself, so it's, <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little moving on. Now another one of these groups that I really, really find interesting and I'm borderline obsessive with researching is, of course, the Manson family. Now Charlie had a pretty rough start in life. He was originally named No Name Maddox, and his father is believed to be a man by the name Colonel Scott. He eventually became known as Charles Millis Maddox. I believe he was later adopted by Kathleen's husband that she married before Charlie's birth, who was named William Eugene Manson. They later divorced, but Charlie kept his last name. As many of you will know, Charles Manson sent out his family members to begin what is called as Helter Skelter, which was a name for an apocalyptic race war that Charlie had predicted. He had his followers believing that he was Jesus. They would all take acid trips together and he would reenact the crucifixion while everyone was high on LSD. And since it's known as like a mind expanding drug, I've never taken it myself. I don't, I don't do that stuff. I don't even really drink that much. I'm boring, man. It was pretty easy for them to be programmed in this manner. Now, sometime before the August murders, Charlie had an altercation with a man known as Lots of Papa, who happened to be a drug dealer. Tex Watson, one of his followers, had ripped him off, so Charlie had to go take care of the situation, as he says, and he ended up shooting Lots of Papa in the stomach. Well, later on, it came out that a black panther was found dead. Charlie thought that he had killed him. He started to become increasingly paranoid and decided to set Helter Skelter in motion. And on August 8th, 1969, he sent out Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Linda Kasabian to Benedict Canyon to kill someone famous and get the ball rolling. Now he picked 
this house, this certain house in Benedict Canyon for a reason. Charlie had previously been trying to become a famous musician, and this was the home of Terry Melcher, the son of Doris Day. Terry was originally supposed to meet him and listen to some of his music, but he wasn't fond of him. Terry felt like creeped out and nervous and just uncomfortable with Charlie, and he didn't think that he had what it took. Instead of simply saying that, but I don't know if Manson would have listened to that, he decided to just blow him off, and this made Charlie crazy. It made him just lose his mind. That, on top of his dreams being crushed, and then that altercation with lots of papa, he decided that it was the time. But Charlie sent them out to Benedict Canyon to Terry Melcher's old house, even though he knew someone else was living there. He ended up going up there before trying to look for Terry, but he wasn't there. And I'm not sure if this is 100% accurate, and if I'm mistaken, I, I sincerely apologize, and I will make sure to leave a pinned comment or something in the description. But Charlie had one up there before, and I think that Sharon had gotten a glimpse of who he was. When they arrived, Tex cut the phone lines and encountered an 18-year-old boy who was visiting the caretaker, William Garrison, named Stephen Parent. And Mr. Parent had begged for him to just let him go. He shot him multiple times point blank. Linda Kasabian was not directly involved in the murders themselves, besides simply driving the group there. She ended up turning state's evidence after they had been discovered and testifying against the family. After Tex shot Stephen Parent, three of them went inside while Linda Kasabian stayed outside. Tex, Susan, and Patricia killed all of the occupants in the house, including Sharon Tate, who was eight months pregnant, she was also the wife of famous film director Roman Polanski. They killed a man by the name of Wojtek Frykowski, who was a friend of Roman's from Poland, Jay Sebring, who was a celebrity hairstylist, and also Abigail Folger, who was the heiress to the Folger coffee fortune. The next night, August 9th, 1969, the group went out again, this time involving Leslie Van Houten. Now, Linda and Susan did not go to the LaBianca residence. This was the murder of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca. Both husband and wife were stabbed multiple times. Lino had a knife stuck in his neck and he also had the word war carved in his stomach. Later, they were all arrested and convicted. Other members of the Manson family will later be arrested and convicted for different crimes, such as the murder of Gary Hinman and the murder of Donald Shorty Shea. These are not the only crimes that members of the Manson family have been involved in. Lynette Fromey, also known as Squeaky, eventually in the 70s tried to assassinate President Ford. But she wanted to discuss Charlie and the family's organization, Atwa, with the president, but she knew that she wouldn't be listened to, so she brought a gun to grab attention. Not the best plan, but I mean, you got attention, right? And as far as I know, both Squeaky and fellow member Sandra Good are still dedicated to the family. The members who were involved in both the Tate murders and also the LaBianca murders were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. They were originally sentenced to death by gas chamber, but California abolished the death penalty. Later on, they reinstated it, but they can't take it back. The only member of the Manson family to ever be released for a crime that they were involved in is Stephen Clem Grogan. Now, Clem was involved in the murder of Shorty Shea, and he was later released. Manson himself died in November of 2019. No, in November of 2017 from cardiac arrest. Susan Atkins died in prison in 2009 from a brain tumor. While she was incarcerated, she was known as California's longest serving female prison. Pr prison. Yep. Female prisoner. Tex Watson, Leslie Van Houten, and Patricia Krenwinkel are all still in prison. And I believe that there's someone else that is still in prison, and I think his name starts with a, a, a B. I can't remember. <laughs> well, let's go crazy today. I'm, I'm feeling wild. If you are interested in the Manson family, there are quite a few decent documentaries on YouTube, but one documentary that I highly recommend came out this past summer. It was also called Helter Skelter, and it was released by Epix. And I will try to leave a link to it in the description. It is so good. 
I watched it repeatedly. It was so fascinating to me. Are you kidding? My battery's dying. Okay, I'm back for like the fifth time. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. By the way, the dude's name was Bruce Davis. He's one of the other members of the Manson family that is still in jail, to my knowledge. This video is probably gonna be a shit show. I'm so sorry. Everybody has those struggles. But yeah, the Manson family situation was wild. Another particular cult that is pretty well known and one that fascinates me due to their interesting ideology is Heaven's Gate. Heaven's Gate was led by two people by the name of Bonnie Nettles and Marshall Applewhite. You can tell my face is getting pink and know that that's not from blush, that's from frustration. <laughs> now this group believed that there was a spaceship in the tail of the Hillbop Comet, but they believed in what is called Tella. Tella stood for the evolutionary level above human. They believed that their bodies were simply vehicles and whenever the comet came around, they needed to evacuate so they wouldn't miss the spaceship and their chance to paradise. Now, they used tactics that were different from some of the others that we've discussed. A lot of the others used more traditional techniques like Manson he was a master manipulator, so he tried to dig into people's psyches and figure out what their weak spot was, and once he found it, he preyed on it relentlessly. And with the FLDS, they used the means of religion. But Heaven's Gate, they would try to lure people in via the internet, and they their website is still standing today. If you guys want, I can leave a link to the website in the description, and they have... Let me see. Let me pull it up. Okay. For instance, this is part from their website. Whether Hale-Bob has a companion or not is irrelevant from our perspective. However, its arrival is joyously very significant to us at Heaven's Gate. Our 22 years of classroom here on planet Earth is finally coming to conclusion. Graduation from the human evolutionary level. We are happily prepared to leave this world and go with T's crew. Bonnie and Marshall were known by multiple different names. They were known as T and Doe, and Bo and Peep, and a few others. Doe was Marshall, and T was Bonnie. They have a photo of how a member of the Kingdom of Heaven may appear, and it's the standard alien that you think of. Usually whenever we discuss like old-timey ideas of like UFOs and stuff, even though that this was from the 90s, highly recommend you check it out. It has all of the 90s glory in it, too. <laughs> all of the early, early internet goodness. Now, the group itself originally started in 1974, and they traveled across the country trying to get more congregants to their group. On March 26, 1997, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department received an anonymous tip regarding a mass suicide. Now, the deputy who first entered the property, he was taken back by the strong odor of death. Now, I believe he only saw about 10 bodies, and then he ended up calling for backup. After a search, they discovered 39 bodies, which were all later cremated. The Heaven's Gate story was heavily covered in the media, including some of Marshall's goodbye messages. One of the people who discovered the Hale-Bopp comet, Alan Hale, once the news became public, his phone was just constantly ringing. He didn't speak to anyone regarding the incident until a later press conference. For this mass suicide, they each took barbiturates, usually mixed with pudding or applesauce, and drank alcohol, and they covered themselves with a bag, and they were all dressed in the same manner. All of the members were dressed in track suits and were wearing Nike shoes, and they had patches on their sleeves that read Heaven's Gate Away Team. If I can find some good documentaries or like clips from documentaries, I will try to put them in the description. We're almost done with the makeup, y'all. I have this bad habit that I've gotten into of just talking about the story and not doing <laughs> any makeup. It's got makeup and history, but I like to talk, so it's a problem of mine. Which brings us to the infamous Jonestown. Now, Jim Jones was the leader of the People's Temple. Growing up, he was always incredibly obsessed with religion, but he also felt like an outcast. I plan on also doing a deep dive on this later. Just brief overview. 
Jones was known to be very charismatic. He wanted his church to be integrated. He felt that him and his congregation should help the poor. They had a lot of socialist beliefs. They built homes for the elderly to be taken care of and it all seemed to start out pretty good. He became incredibly popular, especially in political society. Jones would mobilize his followers and this was very effective in ways of getting restaurants to serve people of color, to gain political friends and power in the community. Because his followers were so important in getting George Mascone, Mascone? I'm sorry. Because they were so important in getting George Mascone elected mayor of San Diego, Mascone ended up promoting him and appointing him to the chairman of the San Francisco Housing Authority. So he began to get friends in high places. Well, as things seemed to grow and become more intense, Jones became paranoid and his teachings, instead of being solely religious, there was one situation where he ended up throwing a Bible across the room and he was just like, this is just a book. If God's real, strike me down. Not, not necessarily like exactly like that, but you know what I'm saying. His people began to get a little nervous to say the least, but none of them really wanted to leave because they felt that they were doing really good things with the temple. After drawing people in with these fake faith healings that he would perform, he would slowly begin to make them work more and they would sleep less. And that is one of the main tactics that cults will use. It basically makes you feel crazy and you're, you're more susceptible to what they want you to do. You're more susceptible to fall into those situations. What they are the most notorious for is Jonestown. If you guys haven't heard of Jonestown before, which I don't know how, but if you guys haven't heard of Jonestown before, people began defecting from the group, citing the public beatings and abuse within the group, including sexual misconduct and sexual assault. So once these people defected, they would go to the media and the media started to just hound them. Now this made Jones' paranoia grow and grow and grow and grow, and he also became addicted to drugs as well. As I was saying before, I was rudely interrupted by my camera deciding to die for about like the third, fourth time filming this. Pressure was beginning to mount on jo George Jones. <sighs> Pressure was beginning to mount on Jim Jones and the People's Temple. The scrutiny from the media began to intensify. Before the publication of an article in the New West, one of the editors called Jones and read the article to him. Because of this, Jones decided to immediately leave for Jonestown, even though it wasn't ready. He began to encourage that other members of his congregation follow him out there, and eventually the population of the group grew to over 900 people. Now in November of 1978, Congressman Leo Ryan visited Jonestown to conduct an investigation into the claims of abuse within the temple. Ryan was joined by various members of the press from different outlets. They were all interviewing different members of the temple. You can find some of this footage on YouTube and if I can find any good ones, I'll make sure to link them. Now, the People's Temple usually held nightly meetings, and during one of these meetings, while Leo Ryan was visiting, they held one of these meetings, and a member passed a slip of paper to one of the people, but he had dropped it. A small child pointed out he passed a note, and then it all kind of went downhill from there. People began expressing wants to leave, and Ryan was going to take some of these people with him. While they were trying to separate some of the groups, Congressman Leo Ryan stayed behind to help negotiate the release of certain children from family members because one parent would want to take them to leave and then the other parent didn't. Now, while he was doing this, one of the members came up behind him and held a knife to his throat. He, he did end up being injured and, and he left as soon as possible bringing some defectors with him and they made it all the way to the airstrip at Port Kaituma. Jonestown had a group of security guards composed of Jones's most fervent followers, and they followed them to the airstrip and opened fire. 
and this killed Ryan, a few journalists, and a defector. Later on, Jim Jones called a white knight. Jones ordered his followers to drink a flavor aid concoction. It is not Kool-Aid. That phrase, drink the Kool-Aid, is incorrect. It was flavor aid laced with cyanide. Some of the people who didn't willingly drink the concoction were injected. He ordered first the children. Over 900 people died that day. What happened in Jonestown is considered the single greatest loss of life of Americans in a deliberate act until the events of 9-11. There are quite a few people who did survive Jonestown. I think approximately out of the over 900 people there, there were about 30 people who did survive. I think that's it for me today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know that it is, again, not one that I usually do, but I plan on doing a deep dive into each of these groups later on. And I'm really sorry if this video is not my best, but I honestly tried really hard. <laughs> Nothing seems to be wanting to go my way today. And I was already having one of those last night, but I really appreciate it. <clears throat> I really appreciate you guys for watching. Thank you so much. If you liked it, make sure to leave a like. And if you're up for more of my shenanigans, I suggest that you subscribe. I do do better videos than this one, I swear. Today's just one of those days, but I did wanna, you know, still upload this and everything to show people that I go through it too. <laughs> I have finals coming up with college, so I've been really distracted and my mental health hasn't been the best here recently you know finals with college I'm not this is the semester of which we do not speak I'm sure every person who has been in school ever knows what I'm talking about <laughs> so, so please please I'm trying um, I may go live sometime in the future just to hang out and stuff so if you guys would be up for that I am up for any suggestions for topics and also makeup ideas Feel free to send them to me on my social media. I will try to put them somewhere around here, I guess. And I will have them on my end card. Make sure you check out Nova Case and their channel. They are the one who drew my end card for me. And you can check out, I mentioned my fiance who streams on Twitch. You can check him out in the description below, Dundra TV. And Nova Case also streams on Twitch as well. So, all right, I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> I made it through the video guys. I made it through. <laughs> it's been like three and a half hours of me trying to film this. So, all right. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you guys and your support and I'll see you next time.